Welcome, welcome to a Friday fireside chat. It's nearly springtime here in Princeton, New Jersey, where I am. And my guest this week is Roger Martin, an old friend, a colleague, a sometimes intellectual sparring partner, uh, and a consultant to CEOs, former Dean of the Rotman School, um, many, many other accolades. And he's got a brand new book out called A New Way to Think which is the brainchild, as I understand, of one of our mutual friends, David Champion at HBR, who Absolutely. really is just, I mean, he's just brilliant. And, and he really has his finger on the pulse of so much of what is interesting. And as I understand it, he was really the driving force behind this book coming into being. So maybe maybe start there. How did this book come about? Yeah, sure. Yeah, he, he was. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, he's a senior editor at uh, HBR and is an interesting gig, doesn't he? He's a senior editor at HBR living in Fontainebleau. So he lives at, in Fontainebleau, France, which I think is part of HBR. And it's also fun for David. So he's he's been my uh, uh, senior editor for the last 20 articles uh, that I've done for uh, Harvard Business Review. And we did one together uh, called The One Thing You Need to Know About M&A. And he was more excited about it than I was, uh, but he was right. It, it ended up being useful uh, and, and well-read. And so we did some more One Thing articles uh, together, one thing on capital allocation, one thing about functional strategy. And he finally said, we should, we should do a book on this. So the, you're right, the idea came from him. Um, and what we realized is that actually uh, my articles have a common theme in many of them, which is which is they they are of the form of here's a model that is typically in use, if not dominantly in use. Here's why it doesn't produce what the people using it wish it did, and here's an alternative uh, approach. Right. Mm -hmm. So so you know we have a model that says, oh, if you want to get shareholder value maximization, you should give your uh, executives, your CEO, lots of stock based compensation. If you look at the track record on that, it doesn't actually have a positive impact on shareholder value as uh, I'm telling you something you don't know. You know? Uh, and, uh, and here's a different, a different model. Mm -hmm. and, and so we said, why, why, why don't we make the, make the book about that, uh, that theme, which is, which is, could we think differently a new way about this particular aspect of business? Um, and if so, what would that, that way be so uh, he was a he was a wonderful instigator and collaborator on on this one yeah he's uh, he's 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 been a, a edited a fair number of my articles too and I As just, too I, you know I didn't actually know that Rita that is, that, is, that is great uh, no he's, yeah, I've got one cooking uh, with him uh, right now which I'm writing with Ram Sharan on uh, oh. organizational structure so that'll that'll be fun but um right right in the front of the book uh, our mutual friend Tom Peters says oh I pay 110 times the value of the book just to get the table of contents because one of the things that's cool about it is you lay out in the table of contents like here's here's the thing we all believe Believe, and then here's the thing you might want to think differently about, which I think is great. You know, so many books you have to really like do a lot of work to get to the essence of what the thing actually mm. is. So, yes, yes. So the lead, the lead can be buried, as they say in, in, in journalism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very much. So let's let's take some of the topics. Um, sure. And I think the first one that I, I think is is super interesting is um, a really different way of thinking about how being a corporation eventually leads to customer advantage at the front lines. And you make the point that each level, each layer has to add value. Yes. And if it doesn't, what you're essentially doing is undermining the competitiveness of your business. And that's a little counterintuitive, right? And the, the, the part that really caught my eye was this idea that, well, so there's this auto executive, right? Then every six months he gets a new car and it's washed for him and it's gassed up for him and anything that's broken is fixed for him. And you kind of lose the plot line. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you certainly don't understand much about the car acquisition purchase, you know, how good or miserable experience it is in the dealership. You don't know anything about uh, the car repair uh, process. You sort of you sort of don't care about durability because because you get a new one every every six uh, six months, uh, and so uh, so that that would be kind of what happens when you're sort of thinking my job in this big corporation is coordinating and controlling, right? Mm -hmm. I've got to make sure all those businesses down below kind of do what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not like, as with all the models, I say they don't work so well. It's not stupid. I mean, somebody does have to coordinate and, and, and control and have some sort of impact of that. But if it takes over as your dominant dominant theme, you know, uh, you know, I work for you. And so you, uh, uh, Rita, think your relationship with me is you coordinate and, and control me. You forget about the help uh, uh, part. Um, and I think, I think the best companies implicitly have that as, as the model, the coal face, right? As you know, you're chipping coal at the coal face, that the coal face is, is where the organization interfaces with the customer. Um, and, and as I say in the book, I, I don't think there's that many people who, who buy Dasani or Aquafina because they come from Coca-Cola or PepsiCo, right? They buy it because they like that, uh, uh, that bottled water and it's available, uh, 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 to them in whatever outlet they happen to uh, happen to be in. So the idea that, that. Coca-Cola should say, well, we have to make sure we control what the Dasani people do um, because they're part of us. And so people will buy because they're part of us. No, at the coal face, customers say, is it better? Mm -hmm. So what are you doing as Coca-Cola to make it better? What are you, what are you uh, doing to make uh, Powerade uh, uh, better or PepsiCo? What are you doing to make Gatorade uh, better? Are, are you providing something to them that they couldn't get on their own? Maybe you're providing to them cheaper advertising rates because you've advertising scale. Okay, that's good because if they can advertise, advertise more because they're part of part of you and they get more bang for the buck in advertising, that's good. If you can get distribution for them cheaper than they could otherwise, that's good. But you should focus first and foremost on, on that and focus on that for every layer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've watched uh, during, during your career as I have, lots of de-layering happening in, in corporations. Um, I, I, I like a lot of it, but I don't love the rationale. It's sort of, well, we got to cut costs, so could we take out a layer? It's more what I'd rather have the, the, the decision-making being is, does this layer help the layer below uh, be more competitive at the coal face or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if, and if you were sort of saying, well, hmm, I don't know, get rid of it because you know, one thing for sure, that layer costs something and those costs have to be allocated to somebody, the coal face, you know, I mean, you know, you, I'm sure you've talked to a million managers who are snarly about the allocated corporate costs that, uh, that, that come down um, and, and you're going to make them less flexible uh, mm -hmm. the, if they're competing against somebody who's, who's only in, in the business in question that you're competing with, they can make decisions quickly. They don't have to ask anybody. So it's a, it's a way of pairing things that I think is more intelligent than, oh, our costs are too high. Let's, let's chop a layer. We keep layers that can demonstrably add more value to the layer before than they cost. And we simply get rid of entirely layers that, uh, that there is no theory or even argument for how it is they create extra value. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think what's happening in many cases now is technologies taking over some of what managers used to do you know yeah. i mean the sort of prototypical manager walking around with a clipboard saying you know what's going on i mean a lot of that's being replaced by algorithms now right so yes. um, and yeah. not all not always for the good i, I would add um, right. so i was talking to christopher mims who's the um technology columnist for the wall street journal and he writes the, the kind of future of everything yep. Uh, column and uh, we were looking at the whole question of global supply chains which I know you've written about extensively and you know more is not better optimization is not always good and algorithms do not hold all wisdom but at the same time a lot of that sort of work that human beings were spending a lot of time on isn't really necessary in many cases now yep um, so and, and on and on some and on some of that you know the the computers just are more reliable and they yeah. and they do it better. So though no, you're absolutely right. You gotta figure out, figure out where where something can be reduced. This is back to my design of business book. Where can something be reduced to an algorithm? Uh, then you should computerize it. Where it's a judgment call, careful, careful. 
Absolutely. So let's come back to customers, though, because I think that's such a, such a fascinating kind of end of the story. I mean, and it really is a theme throughout the whole book, right? Why, yes. why serving shareholders doesn't actually win for shareholders. <laughs> and yes. things about, um, you talk about uh, cumulative advantage, which I've always yes. thought was a fascinating concept and goes right back to in theory, you know, we have the resource-based view of the firm and how uh, there's these time dependent um, factors that come in and the power of habit. Yes. So maybe yes. you could expand on that a bit, because I think that's sure. kind of intuitive to a lot of people. And a lot of people, I think, think buying behavior is all about the latest shiny object, right? And yes. And you kind of make the counter offer. Yes. And also people, people they, they think uh, there's two things that I think are mistaken, that, that buying is about the shiny object and that that loyalty is, is uh, this conscious thing called loyalty is the most important thing. And 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 Fred Reitkeld is a friend of a friend of mine, NVS. You know, uh, he, I mean, he's and, and we we've uh, we've had uh, been on his uh, podcast about this, which is I think his principle is correct, but the driver behind it is is a little bit different than 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 perhaps is imagined. And that is that the mind kind of the key thing in here is the mind is sort of like an iceberg. Uh, the five percent that you can see above the water is your conscious. Uh, uh, reactions. You consciously saying, "I uh, Tide has done such a great job for me in doing my wash for the past 20 years. I'm loyal to Tide. It turns out that, and the behavioral research is sort of really clear on this. It turns out that it's much less about that than Tide is your habit. And when you walk down the aisle uh, and, and to buy a detergent, it's almost as though your subconscious is screaming at you, uh, Rita, you know what we do now, right? We dump the Tide uh, uh, bottle into our cart. We don't think, don't, don't go near that Purcell. No, 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 no. I'm not comfortable. Like the, the, the mind, the subconscious really loves and seeks out comfort and familiarity. So if something has worked for you before, it tells you, in a relatively overpowering way, do that thing again. Now, if there's no tide on the shelf because it's out of stock, because you've done a crummy job on your su supply chain, the subconscious will sort of give in and say, oh yeah, we, we got to wash our clothes with something. So try that new thing. But otherwise, otherwise they say no. So it turns out that, that advantage is cumulative. All right, if, if I have, have gotten you in a habit of buying the same thing over, over and over. Um, I mean, I do work, work for Ford Motor Company and, and it's, it's almost as though F-150 drivers at a certain point in the cycle of the vehicle almost just, just sort of can't prevent themselves from walking into the Ford dealership and saying, I want another one of those because it's, it's, it's a habit. They don't say, now I have to think back. I think here, should I buy a, a Ram or a Silverado or a Tundra? It's sort of like, no, you have that cumulative advantage. Mm -hmm. And why that's important is that, that companies can, can break those things uh, up uh, in, in ways. I don't know if it irritates the hell out of you too, uh, Rita, but I have my favorite, I have my favorite apps, right? Uh, and every once in a while, the clever people at the app will do a quote refresh that puts all the buttons in different places and the navigation at their, differently. And it's all for my benefit, right? And I, and I absolutely hate it. Um, and, and so the last time, so I always used to use cbssports.com. That was my go-to sports app. The last time they did a major upgrade, I think my subconscious was so mad uh, because I, I could no longer navigate easy. I had to learn it. I, I, I said, okay, time out. Now's the time for me to, to reassess all the sports app and pick the one that I want to go with. And so now you will see on my home screen, ESPN.com. Uh, so they lost me while they were trying to, to serve me better by interrupting my habit. Uh, does that mean you should never you know, uh, refresh your software? No, but I would argue that you should do it in 10 little steps mm -hmm. rather than one big one. Right, right. So my I mean, colleague, Eric, Eric Johnson, has a fabulous book about how we decide. And he opens the book with this fascinating question, which is, 
and I think it's Google that pays Apple something like $11 billion to be the default search thing on the yes. home screen of the iPhone. And, yeah. and you, you can get rid of that default with like six steps. I mean, it takes, yeah. takes 30 seconds to do it. And yet the overwhelming majority of people just don't. So yes. that Google search box is sitting right there you know, yeah. in prime position. And, uh, and so what Eric talks about in his book, which is fascinating if you're, if you're not familiar with it, um, he talks about this exact thing, which is that we give so little thought to how we make these thousands of decisions that we make all the time, yes. um, and that it really is habit. The other, the other book that comes to mind is Eric um, um, Martin Reeves' book on imagination. He, he's a book called The Imagination Machine, and oh. what he talks about is exactly That's his latest. This. Yeah, yeah. He he says, you know, most of the time we're just doodling along on autopilot, and like, and yeah. our brains are perfectly happy to just do that. And it's That's only when we encounter some kind of interruption or shift in what we expected that our imaginations are actually engaged. And the rest of the time, we're perfectly happy just you know, kind of sailing along. And, and, and in fact, I mean, it's even more extreme, not not perfectly happy. It's, it's delighted to, right? And we're driven. Turns out that the brain just uses so much energy uh, thinking that that we have biologically been designed to turn it off as much as humanly possible so that it's available uh, for the times when we need it i mean if you just think driving to driving to work if you if you if you're driving to work every, every day if you actually had to think consciously about okay i got to keep the steering wheel just like this and oh there's a left turn coming up here and i got to do that you don't even think about any of that. If that's right. all, steering is now automatic. Your route to work is completely, completely automatic. But you know there could be that, you know, whatever little old lady uh, crossing the street on a on a red light. Your brain knows it needs to be absolutely ready for that time, uh, and it needs all its energy for that. Because mm. if there were little old ladies popping up all all over the, all over the place on the way to work, you'd get to work exhausted. Um, right. Uh, so you need to you need to have the, the the time for that and turn it off the rest of the time, and that's and that's why most most ad copy is I it just flabbergasts me how how wasteful it is. Ad copy is generally directed at your conscious. There's some complicated story about a mother and a daughter and da, 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 all of that, and the, the 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 advertisers are assuming that the conscious is going to pay attention to that story and absorb that story and say, ah, that's the big aha. Mm -hmm. The best ads show you doing what they want you to do. Why are beer ads so popular? What do they show on beer ads? Drinking beer. <laughs> Drinking beer. beer. Right, and and the the cleverest uh, kind of uh, uh, alcoholic beverage ads actually show you ordering it, right? So so you know even though advertisers would hate to do it, a great ad for Tide is showing a a person picking a Tide bottle off of the shelf and putting it in because it's the message to the subconscious is just do that, do that, right? Do that, do that thing, do that thing, not some complicated thing that requires full engagement of your conscious to deconstruct and interpret, you know, kind of what they mean by, by that. So advertising in general, uh, it does not take account of how the, the brain actually works. It's a romantic notion of if you have a magnificent story, people will pay attention to it and, and they're like, no, <laughs> that's not the way it works. That's fascinating. That is so <laughs> and it, it goes back to some of the research on uh, willpower, for example. And there's this all this evidence that says willpower is actually a limited supply commodity. <laughs> and that if you yeah. are put in a position where you have to exert willpower all day long, it's just going to completely wear you out. Yes, absolutely. Right. I mean, the best the best way to think about your business, your product, your interaction with the consumer is the thing that you can do that's best for them, which they will reward you with, is making it easy, making it comfortable and familiar, right? Mm -hmm. if, that's what, if that's what they can do, that's better for them. You're not pandering to them. That's actually better for them. Mm -hmm. And they will reward you big time. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why, that's why you, know, after, you know, after 75 years on top, uh, Tide has all this cumulative advantage. 75 years of history of it being comfortable. Um, 
And, and when tide every once in a while makes a mistake, tide cold water, they put in blue bottles. It was disastrously ineffective. And, and, and what, we want our what was the, we want yeah, our yeah, what was the big complicated fix? Was it to make it wash even better in cold water? Was it to advertise more intensively? Orange bottle. <laughs> that's, that's it. That 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 that's all. That's all it uh, it it had to do. So so you have to be have to be careful. But it, you know, if you're head and shoulders, it's sixty years head and shoulders on on, on top, right? It's like I I had get dandruff. I I use head and shoulders, and and it would be very difficult mm -hmm. for anybody else to break up that uh, the cumulative advantage. That they have so think thinking about it and that's why some you know just think of the great brands right i mean apple right you just know it's an apple product when you pick it up mm -hmm. right you just know your mind says oh i'm so comfortable with that uh that makes me calm that makes me happy uh and getting to that point is what mm -hmm. you should be trying to do not jerking them around very interesting. So in the book, um, you talk about strategy and strategy creation. You use the example of from P&G, which also you know, picks up from one of your previous books called Playing to Win. Um, and I think people would be very interested in maybe walking through how you do strategy, because sure. I think this is like the subject of such mythology. I mean, I go into firms and it's like this, you know, the gods go into the chamber and they burn incense and, you know, the clouds <laughs> emerge and some yeah, mystic, yeah. mystic reality. And, and it's like, like whenever I've done strategy, it's never looked like that. Yes, <laughs> I very yes. much like your approach about what, what would have to be true. So maybe, yes. maybe take us through that journey. I think that would be really fun. Yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, so I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, there, there's so much mythology about about strategy. But what, what I, 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 you know, when AG Lafley and I wrote playing, playing to win, we our goal was to make strategy simple, fun, and effective, rather than complicated, onerous, and something you you put on the shelf. And so the idea behind uh, behind it is first and foremost, you should think about strategy as a problem solving uh, technique, right? So. And if you don't define the problem you're trying to solve up front, chances are you're you're not gonna you're not gonna solve uh, that problem, and it's hard to anchor strategy on something. In some sense, def defining the problem is the objective function. Did my did my strategy solve the problem? And the second thing I say about strategy is is strategy is about making different choices than you've made in the past because the problem that you have today is a function of accumulation of all the choices you've made. And we don't know the definition of insanity, right? If you, if, you know, if, if you keep doing the same thing and, and, and hope that gap is gonna go away, uh, it isn't. So you define a problem and then ask the, ask the broadening diverging question, um, uh, what are the possibilities that I can imagine that would make this problem go away? What set of choices could I make a this set of choices and then i say put that aside for a minute and say how about another one and how about another one so i think the divergence is really important because in strategy i don't know if you find this in strategy exercise often there's just this desire to converge really quickly mm -hmm. and uh, i mean you know you're you're a master of, of the art of innovation that in my experience is not is not how you you get innovation so you go broad to imagine possibilities and then do what you described uh, uh briefly read it which is to reverse engineer the possibilities ask no, don't ask the question what is true right because most great strategies make something true that isn't currently true. So if you ask, is this true uh, now, you'll eliminate things. So ask what would have to be true about the industry, about our customers, about our capabilities, about our cost structure, about competitors, what would have to be true for A to be a great idea? And you put that aside and ask what would have to be true for B, for C, for D? Uh, and then you've got you've got essentially the logic structure of of strategy. These things would have to be true for that to be a, a good idea. Then you can turn around and have the management team that's going to have to choose and commit to one of those to ask the question of all the things that would have to be true. Which are we most worried about are not true now? Oh, we're not sure that the distribution channel would go for that. 
we're not sure that competitors wouldn't come and immediately and successfully attack us. If you do that, you those are what I call the barriers to choice because you tend to not make a choice if there's something that would have to be true that you're worried about is not true. And so at that point, you can really focus your analytical guns on those few things about each <clears throat> possibility that would have to be true that we're least uh, likely to, to be, believe are true. This is different from most strategy where you do that analysis up front. You say, let's do a SWOT analysis. Let's collect a bunch of data and everything. And what I find about that is it, it, it gets you analysis that's sort of a mile wide and an inch deep. And that never, almost never is sort of declarative. It doesn't help you. What I want is analysis that's an inch wide and a mile deep because we know exactly what the problem is. It's mm -hmm. will customers or will the distribution channel, as in the case, case that I do in the article, Olay, we're going to transform uh, oil of Olay to Olay and it's going to be mastige. It's going to be, it's going to look and feel like you're in, in a Sephora or in a Bloomingdale's first, first floor. But boy, will the distribution channel, will the retailers go for this or not? Don't know about that. But if that's your question, then you can do as PNG did is go to Target and say, can we do an experiment with you? We'll, we'll partially fund it. Can we do, do a trial where we set this up and see whether you actually get a big boost in your sales per square foot and the, the gross margin dollars you earn, blah, 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 blah. And sure enough, you can, you can convince yourself by that experiment that that's not something we need to worry about. Uh, we can check that box off and feel more, uh, more confident uh, in it. So it enables you to do stuff that's, that really pointed exactly at overcoming that barrier to, uh, to you cho choosing. So that in the end, what you want to hope is that the choice is easy at the end, rather than you have to go with all your strategy analysis to an offsite and fight over, should we do A or B or whatever? It's sort of like, hey, this is, this is obvious. This is a, this is a no brainer. Mm -hmm. So that's what would have to be true is a more important question than what is true. What is true is the dominant question that's asked in strategy. And Absolutely. I don't think it's helpful. Well, and the other thing that I think we all struggle with is uncertainty, right? And and what you've just outlined to me is very consistent with the work I do in the innovation space, which is, you know, you're always dealing with vast numbers of assumptions you have to make relative to knowledge that you have. And the amount of human breath that gets wasted about arguing about whether the number is 72 or 53 or 24 is ridiculous. It's like, go out and go out and do an experiment. You know, you're, you're, you're operating without any, any information at all here. And so it's, it's really um, uh, kind of futile. Sometimes I get pretty frustrated with companies that are like, and, and by the way, you know, making a decision fact free and going for it is often much more expensive and much more prone to real failure than doing a cheap experiment that can teach you. Something. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no. And, 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 and there is sort of this this I don't know if you find it, but there's sort of a, a technocratic view of strategy. Right. Which is that strategy has got to be right. We have to be sure. Uh, we can plan for it. And I find, I don't know if you're finding this these days, uh, Rita, but I'm, I'm finding there's lots of people these days are sort of discouraged by the combination of COVID and now, and now Ukraine, sort of like there's so much uncertainty, why bother even trying? Um, and I, I sort of think that's sort of the technocrat's view. If you can't have it be perfect, don't do it at all. Whereas sort of the more entrepreneurial uh, strategist says, hey man, nothing's ever certain, exactly. nothing. Um, uh, all you can do is, is try and shorten your odds. And I, that's what I think of strategy is doing is if the odds of success, if you just randomly did, did stuff was a hundred to one, if you could bring that down to seven to four, it's, it's, worth, it's worth doing it, but yeah. never fool yourself into thinking it's certain. Because if you do, in, in my experience, if you do, you take your eye off the learning ball, right? Like you know, even if your strategy is quite good, um, you still have to tweak it and modify it and, and uh, adjust it. 
I don't know if you know Bill Buck, Bill Buxton. He's the guy who sort of brought the world uh, multi-touch. You know, the ability to play. You know, you know expand this uh, screen. Whatever. He wrote a great book on 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 design where he had a a sarcastically kind of uh, named chapter on the instant success of the iPod because everybody thinks it was a fantastic, it was an instant success. And he shows the four major design generations that went through after launch to become the thing we now think of iconically as the iPod. Mm -hmm. And his view is that one of the geniuses of, of uh, Steve Jobs was, was he didn't fall in love, even though people think otherwise of him, he didn't fall in love with it. The first iPod had a bunch of good things about it, but it wasn't yet sort of the like the perfect icon that it is now. And that took four iterations. So I think if you think that you can achieve perfection, then you won't be asking yourself uh, kind of what about this thing that can, customers seem to seem to kind of like could make it just superb. Yeah, even even better. Yeah. I mean, Tony Fidel, who is one of the fathers of the iPod, um, used to get up and give a talk, and, and he's a real builder, right? I mean, he's a you know, yeah. people, he's not as much of a brand name as you would expect him to be, but um, he's and he's got a new book coming out, and I think it's called Build. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but he uh, he'll give a, a like a TED talk and talk about all the things he worked on that never worked out. So he had the concept, for example, for an iPod long a long long time ago, but we didn't have fast internet and we didn't have wireless. And we didn't have the ability to update firmware and we didn't, you know, all these things that would be needed to create a complete product. He worked on at General Magic on the on the this thing that was an iPhone like decades yep. before we had any of the supporting technologies. And and so his story of just how they went through so many things that didn't work out to finally get to a place where one did was was really kind of dramatic. Okay. The other thing on strategy that um, and speaking of the Ukraine, I did a I did a seminar for the business school of the Catholic University of Ukraine. I thought, well, you know, they said, would I be willing to do that? I said, of course, you know, I mean, that's the least I can. And, uh, and one of the one of the things I opened up with is a very famous story in strategy. It was popularized by Carl Weick, but I'm told it was written by somebody else a long time ago about uh, the First World War and the Hungarian Alps. And this scouting mission was sent out by a young officer and it immediately began to snow and it snowed for days and the scouts you know, didn't come home and everybody thought they were lost and they thought it was terrible. And then after the third day, the scouting party turns up and everybody's super relieved and it's, this is great. And then they ask, well, how, how did you do this? How did you survive this storm? And they said, well, we were about to give up. We thought we were lost, but then one of us found a map in his pocket. And we thought, ah, oh, with this map, you know, we'll be able to find our way home. And so they used this map and, and, and he said, you know, we, we, we used it, we settled down for the night, we gave ourselves um, the ability to sort of calm down. And using this map, we got here and here we are. And so the, the general who sent these people out sort of, well, could, could I have a look at that map? And it turns out it was not a map of the Alps at all. It was a map of the Pyrenees. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> But I think there's a fundamental truth there, which is if you're in a terribly uncertain, highly you know, unknowable kind of context, having a map of some kind is better than nothing, right? Nothing at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. I, I think that's right. And, and then, then the, and to me, the, the attitude is, is clear, right? Again, or is, is, is so, so important, right? If your, your attitude is if we try something, and it fails, we're stuck, right? We're, whoa, whoa, what's the poor boy to do? No, uh, you keep trying. And this is where, this is where I think, I don't know if, 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 if you feel this way, but for, for me actually in, in, in strategy, Carol Dweck's book actually, even though it in some sense had nothing to do with strategy, almost has everything to do with strategy because you, know, you, you can have a fixed mindset when it comes to strategy or a growth mindset when it comes to strategy. And the growth mindset you know, says, oh. well, it doesn't work yet. That's yes. because we haven't tried. We, we, yeah, we haven't tried it. Tried it. Whereas the fixed mindset says it doesn't work, mm -hmm. uh, and and then we and then we need to uh, 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 dump it. Mm -hmm. I mean, two of the fun non-strategy books that I that I think uh, that have been written in the last ten-ish years, I guess, that really apply that is that then that and the other is Angela Duckworth, uh, Grit. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think if you if you ask the question, what do you need to have great strategy? I think you need grit and a growth mindset mm -hmm. as your as your sort of mental frame to then to then 
do strategy in the most useful way. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. Totally agree. So we have a question from Juan Miguel Robles. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, why is it so difficult for companies to understand their customer priorities and to help all their collaborators to be focused on them and the most important take decisions based on them? Well, I, I think people like to uh, do work on things that are within their control. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why there are a lot more people who tend to be enthusiastic about, about budgeting and planning your costs than to satisfy dissatisfied customers. Because I always say, I always say you know, who's, who, who's the customer of your costs, right? On, 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 the, on the income statement, who's the customer of your costs? The answer is you are, right? You choose how many people to hire, how many things to buy, how many square feet to rent, et cetera. Who's the customer of your revenues? somebody else uh, and you can't actually plan for those like lots of millions of person hours every year go into revenue planning when i think it's a useless activity when i was running the consulting firm i used to be with when i took over running it i banned revenue <laughs> banned revenue uh, uh planning we had no revenue plan uh, because I just said it's 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 kind of useless. Um, so I think I think the reason to 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 your to your the questioner's uh, question the reason is it's uncontrollable and in that sense <laughs> kind of irritating, right? Those customers do whatever the heck they feel like doing, uh, and so it's more uh, it can be more frustrating. But again, it's more frustrating for the technocrat who says. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to plan things exactly, right? For the entrepreneur, it's an exciting challenge, right? It's for the, for for that more that more growth mindset uh, kind of uh, uh, approach. They're like, "Gee, I love what we're doing. That's why we're doing it, not something else." They don't. That's the really interesting mystery to to solve. So the practical answer to the question would be if, if, if you are at the top of, uh, of an organization inculcating that, that fascination with solving the mystery of the customer uh, is, is the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. This is one thing where my, my friend A.G. Lafley was so good at it, right? He's, what, he's, what he said as when he was CEO is that, you know, all, all the parts of the CEO world would want him to come and visit because they always want the CEO to come and visit. He said, I will only visit if you set up for me uh, an in-home visit with, uh, with the local customer. So I'm going to go visit PNG Turkey. I want to sit down with a, a, a homemaker in, uh, uh, in Istanbul for a couple of hours, it wasn't just a show, for a couple of hours, going through how she washes uh, dishes, how she washes clothes, how she cleans the floor, how she do, uh, does all, all of that. Um, and I need to do, I, I need to do multiple store checks. I want to walk a, a few of our, our uh, retailers. What an awesome signal that is, right? It's sort of like, I'm endlessly fascinated. I'm the CEO. I've got a lot on my plate, but I'm endlessly fascinated with customers and want to find out what we could be doing better for them. Mm -hmm. And I care about how my products are displayed on shelves. Are we doing a good job getting them on shelves or we've got terrible shelf space compared to Unilever or whoever, whoever is stronger here? What can we do about, about that? So if you're the CEO and you're doing that, what excuse could the head of Turkey have for not doing that? Mm -hmm. I'm busier than Lafley. Uh, no, right? And so you'll do that. And then, then the people working for you, right. uh, am I busier than the, than the CEO of my, of my uh, uh, country operation? No. So that, that I think is the best single thing you can do to turn that around. It's just, mm -hmm. just show, demonstrate endless fascination and the organization will be fascinated. I, I think that's absolutely right. The other thing I think that is part of the reason this so often happens is that, you know, customers are endlessly connected in a whole chain of experiences. And yet yes. as companies, we tend to break up that experience chain into functions, right? Yes. And, um, and one of my most uh, prominent examples of how wrong this can go is 
anywhere between 68% and 77% of internet shopping baskets get abandoned before people consummate the purchase. And I always tell them- I, 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 never, I did not know that, but that would, oh, oh, that would be consistent with my own behavior. Now that, well, now that you think of it, like I'm not sitting, sitting here saying, not me, not me, I'd say, yep. Yep. Well, me. and what happens is, so, so I mean, you, I, I encourage like leaders to think about this, which is you've spent the marketing money, you've got the customer on your site, you've built the, the site, you've you've taken pictures of your product, you've done whatever you've done to advertise, you've you know you've got all the the, the sort of everything connected, the credit cards, that, you, you've got them almost to the brink of saying yes, I'm going to buy this thing, yep. and then something goes wrong, and then yep. when you yep. dig into what goes wrong, right, it's yep. the shipping cost was too much, the delay in ordering was too long the the thing actually wasn't available in the size that i needed that and, and i had and, a discount code and when i punched in the discount code it didn't it didn't uh, connect for example yeah, yeah. i had that just yesterday i was i was trying yeah. to buy something and i had a, a discount card mm -hmm. and i'm trying to like put the card number oh, in put the, the card number in yeah good and luck to you no, no 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 you have to go to your account you have to upload the discount card to your account and then it carries through to them but it's like that's totally not intuitive behavior for me as a consumer no, no anyway no. <laughs> but i think it's very i think part of the i mean it's a really rich question right but but i think part of the answer is we we balkanize the customer experience yep. into these yeah, absolutely products. And so then yeah, have, yeah, no, no. We've got the website people, and then the discount code people are <laughs> in two different things, and they don't they don't have to talk to one another. Well, yeah. no, you've got the discount discount card people. You've got the people doing the customer account, you know, ownership, and then you've got the yep. people running the website, and none of them talk to each other. No, no, no. I I I think that's no, no. I, I never I never thought about that, but it immediately immediately resonated right. that I that I have banded baskets, and then they and then they. Right. Then they bug you about it. They'll send you an email saying you haven't bought that yet. And by that time, you're just so annoyed of the process. Then the email is actually kind of worse. It's like worse. if they sent an email that said, that said, we've figured out, we've used AI to figure out what we did wrong and we fixed that. I bet I would click and uh, click yeah. and buy, but it's no, it's no, it's more no, come back. Come back and 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 do the thing that frustrated you enough to drop it is, is exactly. generally the approach I think. Or you buy a thing that you buy like every five years, and you yes. buy one of them, and then they come back and advertise more of them to you. And I'm like, who in life buys mattresses <laughs> more than twice? A year, you know, more than once yeah. every five or ten years, right? Yeah. Um, so before before we run out of time, I I did want to kind of pick up from the book. So the book, by the way, is A New Way to Think, just out, Harvard Business School Press. Um, well worth reading, very digestible. I mean, it, and I think one of your reviewers says it's kind of like sitting down and having a series of conversations, which, which is a good way to describe it, I think. But I mean, in your previous book, um, When More Is Not Better, um, you know, we've talked about some of the, I guess, the imperfections of capitalism as we currently yes. have expressed it. And I think since the last time we spoke, it's gotten worse, right? I mean, we've got the, the horrible yeah. situation in the Ukraine, the pandemic just kind of grinding on, inequality, not getting better, stock buybacks kind of all time high. Do you see sort of some kind of turning point in all this when we might move towards a more, I don't know what you want to call it, more, more just sort of form of capitalism? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a tough one, but I, I guess, I mean, you know me well enough, uh, Rita, to know I, I, I am a long-term optimist. Um, and, and this book, in some sense, is a reflection of that optimism. Like, I recognize that I'm taking on a bunch of models that have been ensconced for years, if not decades. But I, I tend to believe that they do, do, do reach a kind of a tipping point. I mean, this is back to, back to you know, a structure, a the structure of scientific revolutions, right? It, which is that enough anomalies start to show up that finally somebody challenges the, uh, the, the model. And, and I think that's, I think that's, I think that's happened on the environment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I think enough consumers, I've always believed this, and I've said this for 30 years, uh, we're not going to get traction on the environment until consumers start to vote with their pocketbooks, right? Uh, you know, when they when when they start voting, then the companies are going to say, you know, I got I got to I got to start changing. That's happening. 
now in, 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 my, in my view. And so you've got all these companies doing net zero pledges, uh, yeah, kind of UN science-based science targets, all, all of that. Is it all fixed? No, but at least, at least I can see that worm uh, turning. I think what we need to have is, is a similar kind of action from both customers and employees. And I think you're starting to see it. Like, I think the great resignation- I was gonna ask is, you about uh, that. Is, yeah, is the first big warning shot across the bow of, of corporations where it's saying to them, you kind of think there's a thing called a labor market and there will always be us in it and we'll always come to work for you. And you don't have to do anything to make our job you know, kind of more fulfilling and share kind of appropriately in the in the spoils of our of our joint endeavor that's what you think but here's here's uh, try this one on i quit right and and if, and if enough of those do it i i, I could well see this first a warning shot over the bow of a we need to have a different relationship between uh, employees and uh, and the corporation or the corporations and and I, it's not in the it's not in the book, but I wrote an HBR article that you probably saw uh, on what I think of as the future kind of long term corporation is going to be it's going to be a joint venture of a pension fund and an, and an ESOP an employee stock ownership plan um, uh, because the biggest players in the equity markets at least in the in the U S fifty percent of investors are retirement investors either pension fund or 401k IRA investors, they're not being served by the current operation of the capital markets, which is short term. Uh, employees are not being served uh, uh, by by their their companies who are grinding down their wages uh, at much lower than the rise in productivity. And so we need a form of corporation that is operates in the interests of employees and retirees. Uh, and and so I think I think we're 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 seeing the breakdown of the widely held publicly traded corporation as a, a useful model, and we'll transform to that. If we transform to that, that'll do a whole lot uh, to help the inequality uh, problem. It'll I think it'll it'll reverse uh, reverse that uh, trend, and it'll deal with the the aging of the world in a in a more uh, more useful way. Rather, it'll it'll make it easier to to have people have a a good retirement life. So I'm cautiously optimistic, but I now am am of the of the view that these things just take a long time. Shareholder value maximization came into vogue starting in 1976. It hasn't worked. It still is the dominant theory. It's a half a century, but I see it starting to starting to break down. But we just uh, change happens. If there's anything I've learned as I've grown older, it's just change hap takes longer to happen than any of us would have ever wished or probably imagined. For me, imagined. I was like, why are we still doing this stupid thing? Well, mm -hmm. just takes a while. Takes a while. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, Bill Lazonic, uh, the at University of Great. Love Bill. Love Bill. <laughs> He's great. Um, and he makes this, to me, what's actually a fascinating argument. He says that, look, if you, if you want to reward shareholders, the theory, right, is that shareholders put their capital at risk and they deserve to get a risk adjusted return. He said, but if you think about it, the only shareholders that really put capital at risk in the modern corporation are the ones that invested in creating the company. Once it's on the public markets, everything else is just trading. Uh, they're not actually putting capital at risk in a, in a sort of you know, in investing sense. They're putting capital at risk in a trading sense. Um, yes. And therefore his thesis would be that, you know, the sort of pervasiveness of stock buybacks and, and what's going on. And he has a recent article in which he talks about Pfizer, um, which of course we know, you know, Alberto Borla has gotten all these awards for being, you know, this visionary CEO. They succeeded in getting this miraculous vaccine into the world. I mean, they've done a lot of really great things. But one of the things that has not been talked about very much at all is that they uh, announced a suspension of their buyback program because they said what we want to do is take that cash and actually invest in the company, for goodness yeah. sake. Yeah. Imagine <laughs> that, huh? 
<laughs> you can't see that. And that that's yeah. what gives them the, uh, the ability, the resources to, to do some of the things that they've been able to do. And I think that's a question we don't ask enough, which is, no. are companies appropriately investing in the skills of their workers and the quality of their workplaces and the, you know, the quality of their supply chains um, and, and, no. and, 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 right? Yeah, no, and, and, and on that, Bill and I are, are of, of one mind on this, which is that, which is that, I mean, the thought is, of course, that the, yeah, the shareholders made possible this, uh, this uh, company, but that, that's just only this narrow thing of stock sold from treasury. And, and, if, and if, again, if you think about what creates all these sort of demands on executives is, is transactions that are completely outside their control. Right, so if you and I, it, you own own Pfizer stock and I don't, and I buy Pfizer stock from you at an at an elevated price, so you bought it at a hundred bucks and I pay you one hundred and fifty for it, you got the extra fifty bucks, not Pfizer. Right. But Pfizer, then in the modern way the world works, moder- they take on the obligation of, of uh, earning a return on my 150, right? Even though they had nothing to do with it, they couldn't stop uh, what, you, what you did. Um, for what it's worth, for what it's worth, uh, 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 my, my, view on, my view on that is that, is that uh, CEOs have to take more responsibility for managing their stock price, right? Which is, which is think about it, Rita. If the CEO doesn't know more about what the company is worth than outside investors, that's prima facie evidence that he or she should be fired, right? So, so, so they should know the most about the future prospects of, of, of the company. So I think, see, I think, you know, again, if I were CEO of a publicly traded company, I would declare, I know more about what this company is worth than anybody else. And if, and if uh, you people out there bid it up to a number that's above what I think it's worth, I'm just going to start issuing stock out of treasury at that price until it gets back down to the number, uh, the number I think it should be, right? Uh, and, and so you will know that it's at the right price when I stop. I will announce that I've started to sell and I'll announce when I've stopped selling. Right now, they only do it in the other way. Mm-hmm. Our, price, our stock price is undervalued. Therefore, I'm going to buy back stock. That has no credibility because they don't do the other, the other side. Right. So I think the modern CEO should, should be saying, when it's too low, I'm going to buy back. And I'll tell you when I'm stopping. When it's too high, I'm going to sell. Tell them when, because my interest is not in making the stock price as high as possible by having you having you people on the outside uh, imagine that it's worth more than it really is my job is to slowly but surely over time make that stock rise for good reasons not silly uh, uh, silly reasons and i'm in charge not you mm-hmm. that would be a, a very a very different uh, approach and i think it would allow ceos because you know i i i, I believe that that overvalued equity is one of the most dangerous things that a company can have, right? When your equity is overvalued, what do you do? You do extreme dangerous things. You go buy, 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 buy things with your stock uh, that end up, that uh, end up being bad for you. You cannot defend it. You cannot defend that price. So, you know, a crash is coming Mm -hmm. uh, and all you do is try and delay the crash. It's like the ghost Uh, of AOL comes back again. Again. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in, instead, it's don't let that happen. Don't mm-hmm. let your equity be uh, uh, overvalued. Like I, t- I tell all the, the CEOs I, I, I work with, the best thing that you can do for the company is have the stock price appreciate very slowly over, the, over your time as CEO. If you do things that, 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 that are perceived as so wonderful that it jerks your stock price up. So if you want to be CEO for 10 years, you'll be better off and the company will be better off if the stock price goes up 10% a year for 10 years and it's double what it was. It is terrible for the company if it goes up 100 doubles in your first year and then stays flat for nine years. 
if that happens, all the capital markets are going to be all over you like a cheap suit, making you do stuff that takes you off the longer game. So you have to be extremely careful about not getting the investors out ahead of the reality of the company. That's hard. It right? is. That is. And it requires the ability to be very candid. You know? mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And not all CEOs are comfortable uh, doing that. I agree. So one um, last thing to sort of think about is we're hearing a lot of buzz now about the end of globalization and the relocalization of supply chains. And, you know, I know a fair number of senior executives who are asking questions like, T -t tell me how exposed we are to the risk of a disruption of supply from China. Just, just, it, 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 just run those numbers for me. <laughs> you know, do, yeah. do you see that, that, I mean, when I, when I was doing my PhD, you know, the, the perception was globalization is a one-way street, like we're going towards globalization inevitably. And I think what we're seeing now, and I've talked to a lot of people who have, you know, employees in Russia, employees in the Ukraine, um, talking about, you know, maybe we need to rethink some of those assumptions. I, I would agree entirely. And if, if for anybody who's interested in that, I highly recommend uh, the work of Denny Rodrigue, uh, who's, uh, who is actually my, my class of undergrad, uh, um, who is now a Harvard Kennedy School professor and has been a globalization skeptic for a, at least 15, maybe, maybe uh, 20 years, and just writes really thoughtful, good things about what you can and cannot optimize in a, in a globalized uh, globalized uh, world uh, so I have been I have been a proponent of his work for a while and and I think globalization is going to be rolled back substantially and it's just the classic it's the classic thing where where you know something worked and it was taken to uh, to an extreme uh, and so, is globalization good? Is it good for the world that hundreds of millions of, of you know, farming peasants in China have been brought out, out of poverty and hundreds of millions in, in, uh, in India? Yes, that, that's, that's all good. But does that mean everything to any end is, is good? Kind of no. And so I think we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, uh, drift back and we will not five years from now be saying globalization is an unalloyed good. And that's what Danny Rodriguez says. He just says globalization isn't an unalloyed good. Let's stop, let's stop treating it uh, that way. Here's the good stuff about it and here's the the bad stuff about it. And and you know, bad stuff about it includes, right, the industries that 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 are most uh, kind of affected by the opening of trade in a given country, the wages in those industries never come back. Never. Right. So, so it's not like, oh, there's a little blip and then they come back. They never yeah. come back. And so, and, and, and so what, what happened was globalization got treated as an economic issue and it's a political issue, right? Uh, you know, if you have, if you have a whole bunch of people hurt by it and a whole, uh, other people helped by it, it's not as though the hurt uh, uh, people just sit, sit on their hands forever and say, isn't that too bad? They, they raise their their voices. Then you have disruptions like like COVID that show, oh, some of the unalloyed good things about it, like like oh, it doesn't matter that it's on a ship for for six weeks and the ships are 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 lining up in in, in Long Beach for longer and longer. Ah, that's okay. That'll, that'll work out. Fine. No, it doesn't work out uh, 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 fine. Um, and you probably know you probably because he writes all sorts of books and is a cool guy, George Stock. Mm -hmm. uh, from BCG, uh, right? Time-based competition, uh, among other things. He showed me an analysis he did because he analyzes every weird thing about the the increases in port capacity in China. This was ten years ago. Here are the increases in port uh, capacity in China uh, over the next ten years, and here's the increase in port capacity along the entire west coast of North and South America. And the difference was was 20 to one. So they're, so, they're, so they're putting in 20 times as much capacity as the, uh, the Americans, uh, North and South Americans are putting in. So what, where is this stuff going to be offloaded? And the answer is, you know, it's, it's one, of those, one of those situations where there's nobody coordinating the game. Right. Each person <laughs> building a port is, is saying fine and everybody over here is saying I'm doing my, my thing, but 
the equation doesn't clear. So he said, we're, you know, we're getting, we're, we're going to have a, we're going to have an impossible situation. So it's like one of those things where if you just say, this is all good, just go, go do it to the extreme. Back to my last book, more, more is not better. More is not better. Some kind of in between is, is typically uh, better. So that would, that would be, but I, I would, I would bet my bottom dollar on globalization being less evolved 10 years from now than it is uh, today. Yes, I would, I would agree. Well, this has just flown by. Um, thank you so much for making the time to um, spend with me in the chats, folks, you'll find references to uh, Roger's website and um, he writes regularly on Medium, um, publishes a newsletter, He's all over the Harvard Business Review and a new book, A New Way to Think, which I can highly recommend and uh, to be continued. <laughs> I look forward to continuing the conversation. No, likewise. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. I mean, it is always a pleasure.